Okay, I want to quickly rush through some of this stuff. Some of you have been asking, where's this registration or this book that you've been talking about? It's in your gym pack. It's called The Good Follow-Up Guide. If your church is a gym-registered church, you will get the book in there. And uh, if you have not yet registered, may I urge you quickly to register and get on board. The second thing about the Christian is that we need to receive him, reception. There are three needs to meet that make it necessary to contact the Christian quickly. First of all, we've got to affirm him. The greatest need is to know that the newborn is not stillborn. Now experience tells us that not everybody who confesses Christ does so for the right reasons. As I said before the break, that zealous believers can be so desirous of winning people to Christ that they force the decision. And so they push people for something that hasn't really taken place in their hearts and uh, so they're not really regenerated. Then again, peer pressure. Not only can peer pressure prevent people from coming to Christ, but it can bring or, or, or give the impression that people are coming to Christ. My husband is, is receiving Christ, so a wife feels, well, I better do it as well. But the revelation hasn't come really to her heart. And so it's peer pressure that has made her make the decision. Uh, an inadequate presentation of the gospel. Gospel can produce a decision that is faulty. You can preach a message, come to Jesus and be happy and get instant conversions all over the place because everybody wants to be happy. And so if we present a faulty gospel, we will actually get faulty decisions. And it's not unknown for the atmosphere of a big crusade or a meeting with talented musicians and singers to produce a decision, in inverted commas, that did not have the element of true faith in it. It was just an emotional thing. So for all these reasons, we must meet quickly with the new believer and affirm that he really is a new believer, really trusting Christ. Paul writes to the Thessalonians and he says, I've sent Timothy to you. Uh, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter had tempted you and our labor might be in vain. That was wise apostolic admonition and we must not seek to be wiser than the Apostle Paul. <coughs> Secondly, acceptance. As I said, in the early days of a new Christian's life he often experiences a great deal of rejection and if he's rebuffed by his family and friends he will need to feel wanted by his spiritual family. Sometimes that is the new convert's fault. When I was pastoring at Leek we had a, a lovely Roman Catholic lady who came to Christ, Barbara, and uh, she literally came to every meeting. And uh, then I got the news that um, uh, her husband was very, very upset with me. He actually said something like this, when I see him, I'm going to shoot him. And the reason was that uh, for him, Barbara, his wife, had fallen in love with another man. Not me, Jesus, you see. And suddenly Jesus was the only news around the table. She was wanting to convert her husband and so she was um, enthusiastically trying to persuade him. She was also telling of the virtues of this wonderful pastor who was caring for her and teaching her all this wonderful truth. Um, when she got baptized in water, he, he was so angry that he, he found her Bible and ripped it up and threw it on the fire, threatened all kinds of damage to my person. And we had to tell Barbara to cool it. She was actually going over the top. And uh, the rejection that she was experiencing from her husband was actually because he was perceiving that she was rejecting him. In fact, tell it not in Gap, I had to tell her to go to the pub with him because that's what they used to do beforehand. And uh, her husband was complaining and saying, you don't care about me and my friends and you're embarrassing me in front of my friends. They say, where's Barbara? And I have to say, you're down that mm -mm -mm church, you see. <laughs> So we had to say, look, go back to the pub with him. And you don't have to drink what you drank before. You can drink Orange Aid or whatever it is, but go back there. So she did. And after six weeks, he looked at her. He says, love, you're not very happy. Clear off to your church. <laughs> <coughs> we need also to show in terms of acceptance that we live in a very performance-oriented society. Um, and... Even Christians are not above this, that, you know, we feel that if we've had a bad week, if we haven't witnessed to somebody or we blew an opportunity, we come into the prayer meeting, our head hangs down, the devil sits on our shoulders telling us, you are a lousy Christian. When that happens, agree with him. 
Tell him, I am a lousy Christian, but Jesus is a wonderful saviour. Hallelujah. Because <clears throat> we're saved by grace, not by works. But you see, the new Christian doesn't know that, doesn't understand all that. And so they think that they've got to perform, they will actually make mistakes, they perhaps uh, will, will feel that God will be angry with them because they failed to pray or because they were unable to come to a meeting. So we have got to get to them quickly and show them that they are accepted in the beloved, not for their performance, but for their position in Jesus Christ. Then thirdly, there's got to be assurance. Many new Christians experience great exhilaration at conversion. I did. But uh, many of them also experience great uncertainty, if not doubt concerning them. Anybody ever here doubted you were saved? Yeah, look at that. Vast numbers of you doubted that you were saved. And uh, they'll slip into some sin and feel condemned. Uh, they'll read 1 John 3 verse 6. Whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. Anybody get terrified when they first read that scripture? Thought I was never saved. And so you've got to get quickly by them and, uh, and show them that it means whoever does not practice sin, whoever does not have a lifestyle of sin, has neither known him. So no birth, not even the new birth, does not need aftercare and their need of assurance of salvation has got to be ministered to them. Now can I make some, a, a recommendation here? That the moment that someone is saved, however they come, you communicate with them immediately with an information pack from the church. Give them a, a, an introduction to your church, the name and address and telephone number of your minister, leader, pastor, elder, whatever specifically welcoming them and inviting them to attend your church. Let there be on that leaflet the details and the times of all your church activities, especially of any meeting that's intended for new Christians, uh, when it is, where it is, and how to get there. Put in it a booklet outlining the plan of salvation and the step they have taken. It never hurts to keep going over and over and over again the plan of salvation and then a copy of the gospel according to your preference in modern English uh, because most people think about the Bible and uh, they've got the authorised version at home always amuses me to hear Christians try and pray in authorised version language and uh, if Christians can't get it right then the, uh, the, the new Christians certainly can't get it right now whatever you do make sure that that pack is attractively presented and packaged hey listen folks the double glazing guys who come around your house produce the superb quality literature. Uh, Macro and all these other people pushing stuff through your, uh, your, your letterbox. It's superb quality literature. Now the Church of Jesus Christ has got a great, marvellous bank of heaven. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills and the wealth in every mine. And we have not got to put over a, a, an impression of a second class God. Now, it, it costs money, of course it costs money, but I can tell you this, that if you will invest for the kingdom of God, the resources of God will always be there. You'll have to exercise faith. A few people have asked me about the, uh, the overheads that we're doing here. And uh, we took a quality decision among our eldership some little while ago to get ourselves a decent computer and to buy ourselves a color printer so that we could do this kind of stuff because it makes all the difference in the world to have a good thing here and folk look at that and it says something about your church. So do things with excellence. Don't, the, the, the days for stuff written on the back of a piece of newspaper are far gone. Then confirmation. Send a personalised letter from the church minister or leader to the new Christian by first class post that same day or at the latest the next morning. In it, repeat your welcome Declare your joy at their new commitment to Christ. Add a brief word of the importance you attach to helping new Christians to grow in their faith and assure them of your desire to be of help and that you're available at any time if needed. I mean, just go over the top to let them know that if they sh shout or scream for help, you or somebody will be available to minister to them. And close with an expression of looking forward to seeing them at the Sunday meeting, midweek meeting, whichever is going to be the focal point for your receiving them. Of course, if the minister is not doing the follow-up, and basically he shouldn't, and I'll touch that in a moment, then of course the name of the Christian who is responsible, together with their telephone number, will be inserted there. 
Actually, when you read the book of uh, the, the New Testament, it's a book of follow-up instructions. Paul follows up his new converts and new churches with a stream of letters. And in them all, Paul is careful to convey his heart of concern for the converts. So here again is wise apostolic administration of the Great Commission. Lastly, care. Within the next 48 hours, at the most 48 hours, the new Christian should receive a visit from the follow-up person or the minister, a short pastoral chat to let the new Christian know you matter to us and you matter to the law. Now, of course, wisdom in these days will demand that you make a telephone call first to advise your intention because all sorts of people knock on doors these days. So make a telephone call, uh, say that you will meet them and uh, it's going to be just a brief visit to encourage them, to pray with them, to perhaps read the scripture with them, answer any questions they might have. And again, this is New Testament pattern. Paul sent Timothy to Corinth as his representative. He sent him again to Thessalonica. And without pressurizing him, for remember that when the, uh, the new Christian gets saved, he may have all kinds of prior engagements that he feels committed to honoring. Without pressurizing him, encourage him to come to church. Tell him that you will be looking out for him and uh, you'll sit with him and familiarize, himself, familiarize him with the church and with its services. Now, if a visit is out of the question, and for some uh, it can be a valid reason that the new Christian does not want you to visit the home. You know, I don't want you to come. My, my father will be absolutely angry with me uh, or, or my husband or whatever. Then a telephone call and a letter will have to suffice. But generally speaking, it's better if we can get face-to-face -face contact as soon as possible. When Paul writes to the Thessalonians, he says, We brothers, having been taken away from you in a short time in presence, though not in heart, we endeavoured more eagerly to see your face with great desire. So much better to have a face. You see, you can, you can hear a telephone call or you can receive a letter, something like this. Come home quickly, I need you. You see, and you, I'm not going to come to that. But you see somebody saying, come home, I need you. Makes all the difference, doesn't it? You're like, sure, I'll be there straight away. So the face-to-face -face contact is very, very important. Now it's here, if you put up the next overhead, Adrian, that the record becomes so useful. If you put on either on your computer or, or on your uh, Ronio card, something very, very simple like this. I'm not suggesting it has to be exactly like this, but space can be allocated on the card to note the various steps that have been carried out, that visits or telephone calls have been made. And in this way, the minister or the administrator can ensure that nobody has been forgotten or overlooked. And special requests can be logged on there. You know, it is requested that no home visits take place. They can be logged, which if they are forgotten, can lead to embarrassment all round and create a bad impression. And uh, you can put an approximation of their age and so on. Now, something like that is, uh, is so important so that everybody who comes to Christ in your church is looked after. So that if one of the visitors uh, who has been appointed to look for them is ill, somebody else can pick it up, know exactly where, they, where they've got to and just carry on. We must take care of them immediately. Now let's get to the next overhead where we're going to talk about intercession for the new Christian. This hardly um, needs mentioning, but I'm going to mention it anyway because we're going to do a great deal of praying for the initial phase of evangelism, and rightly so. The preaching and the preachers depend upon prayer for the propagation of the gospel. Personal witness needs prevailing patient prayer. But when we look at the New Testament... It's apparent that prayer for the new Christian features even more largely than prayer for their conversion. In fact, you've got to struggle a bit to look at prayers for the conversion of the lost when you look at the New Testament. But when Paul writes to the Romans and the Ephesians and the Thessalonians, he says this, I make mention of you always in my prayers. He writes to the Corinthians, I thank my God always concerning you. He labors in birth in prayer again for the Galatians. 
He prays for the love of the Philippians to abound. He does not cease to pray for the Colossians. And no church can afford to ignore this clear prayer precedent that is part of the Apostles' program for bringing new Christians to maturity in the Lord. How many of you know what Jesus is doing right now? He's interceding for us. And surely that kind of pattern needs to be reflected in us as we pray for the new converts. When my son was, was born 30 years ago, uh, my wife had a really bad time. She was three days in, uh, in hard labor, and for some medical reason they didn't want to do a cesarean. Uh, I want to tell you I prayed. I prayed, in fact, I was so anxious about the whole thing that uh, my boss sent me home from work. He said, you're not, not good for man nor beast, clear off. Uh, because I was just so anxious. I prayed for my wife and for that little baby. Uh, my, I became a, a grandfather for the fourth time just recently. And when little Ben was born, uh, we suddenly found him crying with, with extreme pain. And they discovered he'd been born with a hernia. And at two weeks of age, he had to have a hernia operation, which in itself is not quite so serious, but the anesthetic, um, it's vital that that gets administered properly and so on. There was a lot of risk. I want to tell you, I prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. Why? Because they're my family. They're mine. They're important to me. And we have got to look at the, at the new Christian who comes in and says, they're mine. They're mine, they're my family. The Lord has given them to me to care for. And when we have that kind of relationship with them, then prayer for them is not a duty. It just becomes something that you can't help yourself doing. And how many of you know that's the kind of prayer that the Lord loves to hear? I believe that the reason why there has been such dearth, such failure to turn decisions into disciples can be right here, right here. We've just said oh well they're going to make their own way you remember Jesus said to, to his disciples he said Satan has desired to have you all plural to sift you as wheat but then he said to Peter I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail now that's follow up and that's the pattern that we have got to do let's pray for those I mean even the apostle was not too proud to say pray for us so if apostles are, uh, are glad to have the prayer of the saints, how much more vulnerable babes in Christ who are yet unable to pray for themselves? Next overhead, we'll look at the integration of the new Christian. The task of the follow-up covers from the moment that the new Christian makes a commitment to Christ right through until they are integrated into the life of the local church. They've got to be planted in the house of the Lord. And until that planting has taken place, we are still in the process of following up. Now that's not the end of the matter. As J. John said, it's only getting them onto first base. But we've got to get them onto first base before we can get them onto second base. And then onto second base before we can go onto third. So here is only the first stage. Now I just want to kind of refresh you with what you already know about the overall pattern of growth that the, uh, that the Lord has uh, given to us. If you'll put the next overhead, please, uh, Adrian. I've tried to show here in, in a graphic form exactly what the Lord wants us to do in, uh, in the church of Jesus. First of all, uh, there's the world at the top. We've got to meet the world. Now, that sounds very obvious and very trite, but there is no evangelism unless we actually meet the world we're trying to reach. Now sadly, the church has often been so busy with its programs, with its prayer groups, with its training classes, with its meetings, with its committees, that we have no space in our diaries to actually meet the unsaved. And the longer you are saved, the more difficult it becomes. In fact, I have to confess to you that as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, I spend more time doing what I'm doing now than actually reaching the lost. I, I have very few unsaved Christian friends. I've had to sort of get a grip with myself and say, I am going to minister to my barber. Oh, I'm having some great fun with my barber at the moment, but I better not to get sidetracked onto that, but uh, I believe we're going to get him in the kingdom. 
I believe that churches need to encourage their members to go into the world. Does that sound heretical? I believe we've got to get into the world. I believe it's about time some of you took up golf. Do you know, the man who is, who is on the golf course on his own doesn't have any status. And so he is looking for others to play with. Because if you've got four people, then they always get precedence over two and so on. So a number of us have played golf and we, always look, we, we go in threes because we're looking for the fourth. And uh, when the fourth comes to us, he's happy to join us. So we don't tell him who we are, so we just introduce ourselves. This is Gary, this is Tim, this is Bruce. Three ordinary guys. We always let him tee off first. So he, he kind of waggles his club and he swings at it, smashes it, and if he plays like the rest of us, he's usually a rotten uh, shot. And out from his mouth comes the usual thing, oh! which being interpreted means it's a bad shot. <laughs> so then one of us will stand up, tee up, waggle the club, do exactly the same thing. Only we shout out, hallelujah! And he goes. <laughs> and he's got us for 17 more holes. <laughs> now it's fascinating. It's fascinating what happens. Because he starts to ask questions. You don't have to bombard him. He's never been with three Christians who, who are having fun who are actually enjoying them, one another and enjoying Jesus, who actually bring spiritual things into, into a game of golf. And so he starts asking questions. Now, we're not saying that everybody who joins our team gets saved at the end, but that's not the important thing. The important thing is that we are part of the chain. He has a good experience with us. The next time he meets a Christian, he's open to hear the word of God. So we have to meet them. Join a photography, uh, photography uh, club or something. Sign up at the local tech college to, um, I don't know, do pottery. I couldn't care less about your pottery, get, but get among the people. We have got to meet them. And incidentally, please don't isolate the new believers when they get in and say, now you've got to be in this meeting and that meeting and the other meeting, there's a prayer meeting, there's a ladies meeting, and suddenly they're taken away from all their friends. The new convert is the most prolific source of new growth. And so we need to encourage them to stay among their friends, not withdraw from them and to bring them in. Secondly, we've got to merge them. Here is what we're talking about in this lecture. The aim here is establishing the new convert in the local church as a member, as an adherent, not just an attender. Then we've got to mature them. And the goal here is equipping the member to be a disciple who is thus able to develop other new Christians. Here is where your workers come from. Here is Ephesians 4, 11 to 16, where the fivefold ministry equips the saints for the work of service. What is the work of service? They are going out into the world. They are also discipling the new convert. And then finally we have to multiply the leaders. The end here is of course to do with the sovereign election of God to leadership and multiplying of leaders even as Jesus chose the twelve that they might be with him and they, that he might send them out to preach. But the whole thing means that, that we're, we're reproducing all the time. The, the bulk of the leader's work is spent ministering into those who are going to be workers, bringing them, uh, timothying them, or, or uh, as Paul and Timothy did, so that they can become uh, more like leaders. The bulk of the worker's work is spent with the new converts. They're all of them with the green lines reaching out into the world, but each is seeking to do his bit at edifying one another. Now, having looked at all that, let's look at the next overhead. Keeping all that in mind, we look at the first stage of producing membership. And there are three areas of major importance in this process. The first one, you can just pull that straight off, Adrian, is parenting. 
where we are caring for the new Christians. The second stage is programming, where we're changing the church structures to accommodate the new Christian. And then thirdly is preparing, that is developing the people who are to be involved in all this exciting growth. So there are three areas that we're looking at. Parenting, programming, preparing. Let's have a look first of all at parenting. Paul made a plain point in 1 Corinthians 4.15. He said, you might have 10,000 teachers, but you don't have many fathers. But in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. Now, in the natural birth, and there are so many parallels, as J. John was pointing out in his excellent lecture, between natural and spiritual family life and, uh, and birth, in the natural birth, God places the new baby into the care of its parents. They were involved in the creative miracle. They will want to be involved in the careful parenting. In other words, those that bear them are to care for them. Now, I take Andrew Evans' point that he made yesterday that those with evangelistic gifts who may be bringing 20 or 30 people to Christ a year should not be tied down too much. If that's their, uh, their gifting and they're pulling people in, release them to do that. Uh, you'll have to put surrogate parents um, to look after the folk that they bring in. But what I'm talking about here is ordinary Christians bringing people to Jesus. The slogan is, each one, win one. Every one of you is expected to reproduce by next March. Hopefully some of you will be doing it before next March. That'll be exciting, won't it? Actually, I think 250,000 should be easy. I mean, can't you believe for, for one before next March? I mean, you wouldn't get your name in redemption or decision, would you, if you got one saved? So, I mean, we ought to be able to think, if we're praying for three people for the next six months, can't we have faith to believe that three will get saved? That's 750,000 people. Well, why not go for the million while we're at it? And so, hallelujah, the whole thing, it's, it's, it's not too difficult when we start breaking it down in it, into its component parts. Now, what I want to emphasize here is that we ought not to expect that follow-up should be the particular province of the leaders of the church. If we really do believe that God is going to double our numbers, then there will be just too many people for the most godly of leaders to be able to handle. So we've got to look at the leaders of the church as the maternity nursing staff. They're on hand to help with the process of birth. They are there to provide training. They are there to give advice where necessary, to kind of oversee the general health of the new believer. But the aftercare or follow-up work should be done primarily by the person who brings them to Christ. Do you know what that means? It means W-O-R-K. How many of you are parents? Now, you know what I'm talking about, don't you? And that's what we've got to be prepared for. Now, this has two beneficial effects. Firstly, it prevents overload on the church leaders. There are so many bottlenecks in the church. Most of them are in the one man. So we've got to break the bottleneck. Not wring his neck, break his neck. <laughs> and secondly, it provides the new Christian with a powerful picture to practice parenting himself when in turn he leads others to Jesus. If he sees that you have cared for him, then he will know that when it comes to his turn, he has got to care for his converts. Now, I know that some Christians will come to Christ without any personal Christian contact. They will come to a crusade, they'll come to the church, to a meeting or whatever, and uh, there may be occasions when, for good reasons, those who bring people to Christ cannot follow up. And in those cases, we've got to have surrogate parents, those who are able to do an effective job to become follow-up counselors appointed to care for them. Now, what are the tasks? 
Well, before we look at the task list, let's, let's look at the tests. Because every parent who has ever come to the job comes as an amateur. I don't care how many books you read or how many training classes you go to, when junior number one comes along, he doesn't fit the pattern, does he? In fact, neither do number two nor number three. They're all totally different. So we come as amateurs for the job. The important thing is heart. Heart. If we love them, we will get involved with them. And we will learn how to do the job by doing the job. How many of you were perfect parents from day one? What a rotten lot you are. But you see, all your kids grew up and you learned how to do Poor kids, they were practiced on. I mean, by the time we got number four, we knew a thing or two about it. Poor old Duncan, we, we, we made all the mistakes on him and his sisters. So what matters primarily is heart. And I want to tell you that if you will love them, the new convert will be totally appreciative of anything you do. You may get it wrong. You may make mistakes, but if you love them, they will forgive you and probably they won't even be aware that you've made the mistakes. Now, having said that, there are some fundamental qualifications that I believe we should pay attention to. Incidentally, it's worth pointing out that before a man could give away a box of uh, groceries to a Hebrew woman in Acts chapter 6, he had to be properly qualified, full of the Holy Ghost, and faith good man. So when Paul wrote concerning the deacons, let these also first be tested, then let them serve, he was saying that we ought to test everybody in the church. We test the elders before we appoint them. We test the deacons before we appoint them. I believe that here is a prime deaconing job, a deaking job, because all deaking in the house of the Lord is service. And there are a number of uh, qualifications. First of all, they must be active. Parenting is not a job for the half-hearted or for the careless. Too much is at stake in the new Christian's welfare. The task of looking after new Christians is not a job for the backslidden. It demands Christians who are active in Christ, who themselves maintain a personal relationship to the Lord, who have a prayerful reliance on the Word and a practical reliability in the local church. They must not only know God, but be growing in God themselves. Was it David Shearman who said that, that all this thing is more caught than taught? And so we reproduce after our own kind. That's an astonishing thought, isn't it? That in six months from now, the people in the church are going to be just like you. Oh, Lord, help us. When Paul was sent, uh, wanted to send Timothy to Philippi, this is what he said. I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state, but you know his proven character, that as a son with his father, he served with me in the gospel. Paul didn't just send anybody. He chose one who was as committed as he was himself. Secondly, they must be affectionate. There is no sadder thing in all the world than a child that has never known the love of its parents. There was an article in the Daily Telegraph of the 28th of September that reported the sad story of an Irish woman who was born illegitimately and she was placed in a so-called Magdalene home. And she grew up in a rigid regime that was loveless. She was never cuddled, never kissed, never experienced a romp on the floor, never heard the words... I love you. And she said, that has poisoned my whole life. They discovered in a hospital that babies that were placed near the door of the ward were actually growing stronger. And they thought, well, what's going on there? And they discovered that as the nurses were leaving the ward or coming in, they would pat the baby and just simply say a few words. And just that little contact, that little bit of affection was making the, the, the babies at the end of the ward grow much better. Affection, 
affection. This world desperately needs people who can love. It's a loveless world out there. And we've got to show them the love of Christ. Paul said to the Philippians, I have you in my heart. He wrote to the Thessalonians, we were willing to have imparted to you our own souls because you were dear to us. He tells the Corinthians, I will very gladly spend and be spent for you, though the more abundantly I love you, the less I am loved. And so we who would want to be spiritual parents, we've got to demonstrate to the new believer, I love you, I care for you, you matter to me. Thirdly, they must be alert. There are dangers all around new babies. Everything must first be tested for temperature, from food to bath water. Unseen germs mean scrupulous attention to both personal and preventive hygiene. Babies put everything in their mouths, don't they? Cats will want to jump in the pram. Trailing electric cables have got to be put out of the way. When you've got babies around, you've got to have eyes in the back of your head, the top of your head, the front of your head, the side of your head. There's dangers everywhere. Now, as spiritual parents, we are no less guardians of babes in Christ. Which means, first of all, we've got to take heed to ourselves. We've got to look after our own spiritual health and hygiene. We've got to be daily nourished in the Word. We've got to be living spirit-filled lives. And then we ourselves have got to be clothed in the armour of salvation. And we have got to be vigilant against our spiritual enemy. When we are like that, then we can help them. Now, I don't know whether it's ever struck you, but when the manna first fell in the wilderness, the reason it was called manna was because they didn't know what it was. It literally means in the Hebrew, what is it? What is it? Now, Moses said to them, this is the bread from heaven which God has given you to eat. What do you think two million Israelites were waiting for? Moses, you eat it first. <laughs> if you don't die, we'll follow your example. Now that's how it is. We have got to do it first. We have got to demonstrate to the new Christians what our Christian life is all about. It's no good laying things on them, folks. We've got to show them. So we've got to be alert. We've got to have a working knowledge in the Word of God. The milk of the Word is an important part of protective parenting. And then we've got to be assiduous, which simply is a word beginning with A, <laughs> which means diligent. Parents just can't hand the little one over to anybody so that they can go off for a couple of days and enjoy themselves. We've just had some stories, haven't we, in the, uh, in the uh, national press about a couple of mothers who just wanted to go out and enjoy themselves and left the kids. Now, you can't do that. Spiritual parenting is not the work of a moment or two, not even a week or two. We've got to stick at it until they're planted in the local church. Until they will go, even if you backslide. Hello? See, one of the greatest privileges that you or I can have is to be used of God to put a lasting deposit of grace in somebody else's life. The Apostle Paul said to the Thessalonians, you are my crown of rejoicing. You're my kids. And uh, that's going to be a great day, folks, when we get to heaven and there are folk who cross the golden street and shake your hands and say, thank God you stuck with me. Thank God you nurtured me and encouraged me. Bless you. So we've got to commit ourselves to them. Now let's look at the task of parenting. It's threefold. First of all, it's friendship. The new Christian needs friends because he lives in a world of spiritual enemies. He's in an unfamiliar setting. He's entering a church for the first time. Nothing so comforting as the familiar face of a friend. Invite him round for a meal. Get him out for coffee. It has the goal not only of him, of you getting to know him, but of him getting to know you. And let him meet the real you. 
How many of you know that you don't have to keep jumping into telephone boxes and coming out going, yee? <laughs> One of the constant criticisms of the non-Christian is that the church is full of hypocrites, people who put on an act. And the gospel that we proclaim leads folk to have high expectations of professing Christians. And so when the new Christian meets us, he must meet a true friend who does not let them down by pretending to be what he isn't. The Bible says that a brother is born for adversity. So ensure that he knows that you are available, available to be contacted whenever he's in need, even if it is at three o'clock in the morning. There may be questions arising over difficulties he finds. He may want to know how to answer the jibes of his friends his own family relationships under that strain. He must feel that you are never too busy to be bothered with him because you're his pal, his friend. Secondly, fellowship. It's important, at least until the new Christian gets integrated into the life of the church, that the follow-up workers stick to him like peel to an orange. Arrange to meet him, sit with him in the church meetings, if necessary, pick him up, although a word of caution here. Don't make him so dependent upon you that he never becomes a self-starter. But there's a, there's a balance there. Introduce him to your friends at church. Invite him to share in Christian activities, both in and outside the church. Involve him in sports and social events you do with Christian friends. Let him feel an important part of the church family. And if he begins to develop relationships with other people in the church, don't get jealous. Say, hallelujah. And then feeding. Whilst the primary task of feeding the flock devolves upon the leaders of the church, there's a vital part for the parenting person to play in this area. Now, no doubt the church will be running special classes for new Christians. But there's no reason why the follow-up workers should not show them from God's word the promises that are their portion in Christ. Let's look at the things that we are to do. Three very simple things. First of all, ensure his grip. Ensure his grip. Paul speaks of those not holding fast to the head in Colossians 2.18. Salvation is a grip on Christ. And the first visits will soon show if the commitment to Christ was really made. So again, I emphasize, don't be afraid to go over the plan of salvation again. Show him how men are saved. Make sure the foundation is properly laid. Secondly, encourage his growth. The four pillars, practices of the Christian life need erecting. Read, pray, come, tell. Read the Bible daily. Make sure he has a Bible he can understand. Provide him with a plan for reading the scriptures systematically. Show him how to do a simple study, maybe even to mark his Bible. Memorize scripture. Read it with him. Don't just tell him, show him. How many of you know it's much easier to do it when somebody shows you how? Now it's here where the rubber hits the road in parenting. He or she, the parent that is, won't be able to hide hypocrisy. If you tell him to memorize scripture but you can't remember it, if you tell him to turn to Acts chapter whatever and you don't know where the book of Acts is, you're going to be in trouble. So make sure that you can do the job first. Give him assignments. Check his progress. And when he does it well, reward him. Not with uh, money, but uh, with a sincere compliment for good progress. Secondly, pray daily. Encourage them to talk to God in everyday language. Oh dear. Some prayers. Oh, thou benevolent God, thou most majestic and awesome, ineffable, delightsome deity. Somebody was praying like that and somebody at the back of the church said, call him father and ask for something. <laughs> so pray simply with them. Urge them to make prayer the priority of every day. Then come to fellowship. Show them from the word of God that an essential element of Christian growth is regular fellowship with the church family at its meetings. Encourage them to seek fellowship at every opportunity. Home groups, new Christians, classes, as well as the main service. Without 
kind of taking them into too many church services. And then fourthly, to tell others of Christ, to witness by testimony and by the way we live. That's God's way of spreading the gospel. The Christian faith is the only thing that I know in this modern world that grows the more you give it away. So tell him to keep sharing it. Show him how to share his testimony with joy. Teach him to avoid arguments, but to patiently sow the good seed. Teach him by exposure. Take him with you as you do the job. Take him into the open air meetings. Stand by him. When you're visiting other people, take him with you. And then explain his gradient. The new Christian needs to see that God's purpose for him is to rise higher into all the privileges and power that there is available to him in Christ. The slopes of the foothills into the mountain of God take, beckon him to take his first steps in baptism of water, the baptism of the Spirit and healing and what we believe and why we believe it. And there is no reason why you can't explain that. The ultimate goal, of course, is Christ-likeness. That will take a lifetime, but at least you can show him his gradient. Now, our time has almost gone, but I want to be just a little practical in these last few moments, if you'll bear with me. May I recommend to you, if all these things sound a little bit daunting and you think, oh dear, how in the wide world am I ever going to do all that? Uh, I run an organization called Christian Equippers UK, which is a, an evangelism, a personal witness training course where we train folk how to share the gospel and uh, how to follow up. And basically, we have discovered this, and I have checked this in many, many churches that I have visited. In fact, we could check it now. What are the two biggest things that stop Christians from enjoying the witnessing experience? Number one is fear. How many of you find fear one of your big problems? The second thing is not knowing what to say. How many of you find that a problem? Okay. There's a third problem. How many of you have got, like me, good forgetteries? <coughs> yeah. So it doesn't matter how often you kind of listen to your pastor preaching the gospel and so on, you just find it very difficult to remember. I mean, and going through all the four steps to salvation, Billy Graham's book, and all that kind of stuff, it's quite daunting. So Christian Equippers is actually a literature program, and... Uh, it's designed so that you don't have to remember anything. It's all written. It's beautifully produced on art paper, so that it's saying something about you, saying something about your church and your commitment to it. And it has in here all the scriptures and all the steps. And if you can read, you can witness. How many of you can read? Now don't laugh, there are people who can't read. We've got a girl in our church, a gypsy, couldn't read. Someone has been teaching her to read. When she signed her first check, the whole church shouted with joy. It's wonderful. So if you can read, you can witness. Now basically, these booklets allow you to do a number of things. First of all, it's eye gate and ear gate. Preachers don't like it, but you forget 90% of what you hear. That's not very flattering but you will only remember 10% and, and most of those are the funny stories. <laughs> Amazing, isn't it? And if you tell a funny story in a different connection in another sermon, somebody's bound to come to you at the end of the meeting and say, I heard that sermon before. They haven't, they've heard the illustration. So it's eye gate and ear gate. They are seeing because you're showing them as they go through. Secondly, it means that you are Keeping to the point. That's a blank page. That's a good start, isn't it? You are keeping to the point. How many of you know that when the woman at the well was talking to Jesus, she tried to dive down a few alleys, uh -huh, try to get out of the way? And there's a beautiful way of dealing with that, quite gently, that if somebody raises something while you are talking to them, you can say, that's an interesting question. Very good question. Now, let's finish this first, and then we'll come back to your question. And so you keep on track. On the other hand, if it's something that is vital and you feel, yeah, that does need dealing with, you can put your finger in the page, close the book, deal with the thing, 
And then instead of saying, now where were we? Anybody had that? Now what were we saying? You just open the book and you carry straight on. Now, that means that you keep in charge of the witnessing experience. Then, when you've finished, and there's even a prayer in here to pray with them, you can leave it behind with them. And because it's good quality material, they don't throw these on the ground. They tuck them in the top pocket. Or they tuck them in the purse. I've had fellas come back and say, I was sitting in the loo. And I wanted something to read. <laughs> well, the Lord can speak there too. Hallelujah. So there's a number of reasons why booklets are actually good for you. The only thing you've got to remember is where you put it. Now, in the same way, we have a number of booklets on follow-up so that you can sit down and read through. You don't have to have a great deal of training. There's one on new life. There's one on church, church family. There's one on water baptism. There's one on spirit baptism. There's one on why we worship the way that we do. So that all these things are just cheap ways, and the policy of Christian Equippers UK is that we make these available to you at rock bottom price. We're not in the business of making money. So we have to import them from the States. Nobody gets paid any salary. We just cover our office overhead for stamps and stuff like that. You get them at virtually what it costs us. We bring them in in bulk, so you get them fairly cheap. And with those kind of things, it would mean that any of you can do the job without trying very, very hard. Okay? Now our time has gone. If you have any questions you want to see me afterwards, I will be available down here. We haven't covered all the course, uh, but I'm sure you've had enough there in your uh, think tanks to go away with. Thank you for being here this morning and God bless you. <laughs>